name is Jonathan Briggs. I'm the assistant law librarian here at the Fort Bend County Law Library. And we're pleased to have Ira Dominance here as our uh, attorney lecturer in our attorney lecture series. And he's going to be speaking on uh, intellectual, intellectual property. Uh, Ira is a partner in the law firm of Stevens, Dominance, and Meineke. Uh, he's been in practice for not quite 20 years, uh, primarily practicing in intellectual property, both the litigation side of it and kind of in the office side of it, drafting patents and so forth. And he handles a variety of other legal mm -hmm. matters. Uh, he graduated from Boston University School of Law, and he's licensed in Texas, Massachusetts, several of the federal district courts in Texas, and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, the Federal Court of Appeals. Uh, most importantly, he's licensed by the U.S. Uh, Patent and Trademark Office, which is a very difficult licensing to get. You have to take an additional bar exam uh, that's known to be a very difficult one. So Ira is uh, well credentialed and experienced. Uh, has worked for a few different firms here in the Houston area uh, in the intellectual property field. Uh, he uh, also does some work for uh, just to talk about intellectual property, sort of hands-on stuff, he does some work for the Comic Con, the local convention for, uh, mm -hmm. you know, gaming and sure. programs and so forth. So, uh, and Ira and I are also friends. We uh, work together and have been friends for 15 or so years. Uh, he's a longtime resident of Fort Bend County, and he's joined here today by Trina Pham, his assistant, uh, who is about to graduate from college herself. So, congratulations. And uh, I think we're lucky to have Ira's expertise, and I think he'll give you all uh, a lot of good information. So, Ira Domitz. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try. And right. Hopefully, I won't be blushing as much as after that introduction. That sounds better than my resume, for sure. <laughs> um, but anyhow, again, my name is Ira Domitz. I'm a practitioner of intellectual property law. I'm assisted by Trina Pham, who actually assisted with this presentation practice actually out of Houston. This is actually right off of Gessner and Westheimer, so it's not too far away. But let me go into this. We'll get right into it right off the bat. So we're going to talk about mostly copyrights and trademarks. Although I learned last time that people have lots of questions about patents as well. So what I've done actually is I printed out a handout for people, and then you've taken one each. This is from the USPTO, so it gives a real quick overview of the difference between patents, copyrights, and trademarks. And of course, it's written by lawyers, so it's probably nice and confusing. So one other thing I have, too, is I have a demonstrative on a patent because I noticed last time people had lots of questions about patents, but many people haven't seen a patent. So Trina, if you can hold up the patent, I'll pass this around just so you can see actually what it looks like. But this is actually a patent for something you may all have seen before. If you have kids or you were around in the 80s in the United States, I'm sure you saw ads for this type of thing. That would be... Um, I just to see. No, it's okay. Sorry. Yeah. But that's actually, I've seen them. <laughs> that's actually Optimus Prime, the Transformer. Mm, cool. And people actually, the company got a patent on it. So it's an easy one to work with and to talk to people about because most people, if they were kids at the time or they had kids at the time either way you've all seen ads and commercials for it so you can really put sort of paper to actual you know practice in terms of what it is so the question to start off with is what is intellectual property and usually I'll go around the room but I'll just make it easier here it's property that comes from human intellect product from human creation and basically, intellectual property rights is securing and enforcing legal rights for inventions, designs, and artistic works. Now, so before I go on any further, just let me give the caveat that it's a small, intimate environment here, but I'm actually not going to be giving legal advice as a lawyer. If you need a lawyer, obviously consult a lawyer. I'm talking about general legal principles. They may or may not apply to specific instances that people have. If you have further questions or you need a lawyer, obviously contact a lawyer so that you can you know, converse with them about your own instances because each thing, each situation of person is fact specific. But intellectual property comes from human creation. So let me give you an example of the difference between intellectual property and physical property. Physical property is this phone. One of the things about the physical property or real property as they call it in law is that this particular device is one. It's one unit. I can sell this unit to you ma'am for example or to you sir. Right? However, the way to build this unit, 
the way to have the graphic user interface, which is actually the big Samsung Apple case, how it actually works with the person. The intellectual property is that, that which is sort of the blueprints for making or how it actually works. That's one of the big distinguishing factors between intellectual property and real property is, for example, if you buy a piece of land, it's one piece of land. You can either sell that piece of land, rent it, do whatever, but it's one piece of land. If you buy the concept on how to make something or an artwork that can be replicated or duplicated, that is one of the distinguishing factors. It's the fact that intellectual property potentially could be divisible into thousands, hundreds of thousands of units. Anybody here have a Nook or a Kindle? You ever notice how now you don't have to go in and physically buy the book? I just press a button and that book gets sent to you. You never see a physical copy of the book, ever. All you see is code data that basically goes to your computer, goes to your Nook or device, and you can read the book. Now the problem with that is that theoretically you could actually take that and send it off to your friend. However, if you actually bought the book, you've got one copy of the book, you've got one choice. You have the book or your friend has the book. So that's something we're going to discuss in terms of why intellectual property is so important and so interesting for people to discuss versus real property. Any questions so far? No questions. We're already going. You're not sleeping, are you, sir? No, no, no. Okay, good. <laughs> good. It can happen with this class. That's, so that's, why does that's intellectual my property matter to us? Okay. The velvet. And just by the way, so we all know that this is that's me as a kid. And those things are not potato chips, even though people think they are. They're supposed to be flames, and my parents were not really incredibly well off when I was younger, and my mom made me a human torch costume. <laughs> and that's supposed to be the human torch, and those are supposed to be flames, but apparently my brother qualified for Batman. And Velvet Jews, which actually is a TM there, Velvet Jews is actually my trademark name. I actually play in a band. Uh, I'm the drummer for a band, and I'm federal registered now, Velvet Jew is my stage name. So that's a trademark, we'll talk about that. But pop culture is everywhere. This is why intellectual property is so important. This isn't just limited to comic books or science fiction books or anime or gaming. 19 of the 20 highest grossing films are science fiction films. Now I'll give, who here thinks to know what the other one is? The one that's not in the, in the 19. Let me tell you? Yeah. Gone with the Wind. Hmm. Adjusted Dollars Gone with the Wind makes the top 20. Rest of them, let's think about it. There's Star Wars. I mean, we're about to hit a couple more that are going to be in the top high grossing ones. Star Wars, Avatar, Jurassic Park. Name it. It's going to be there. Men in Black. All those things. 15 of the 20 best selling novels are sci fi or fancy. Harry Potter. How about Game of Thrones? That's pretty huge. All these things. So it's become much more prevalent in our culture than it used to be. It used to be sort of a, a niche thing in which people would be almost ostracized, you know, if they were into science fiction or fantasy. But now you go to these conventions, you go to Comic Palooza, as Mr. Briggs mentioned, that's got 65,000 attendees in Houston. You go to Comic-Con in San Diego, you're talking about 160,000. That's a lot of people. So I'm just gonna go to this one. So. My mom, she's not a lawyer. She, she's not practicing. She's a practicing mom. And she always say, even before I went to law school, even after I go to law school, even like today, if I call her on the phone, she'll say, you know, I'm going to blah, blah, blah that picture. I'm going to copyright it. Well, maybe she'll say copyright if she's lucky. Usually it's, I'm going to trademark that picture. No, you're not. I'm going to patent that picture. No, you're not, mom. This is the difference between patents, trademarks, and copyrights. Okay? So, patents protect new inventions, methods, compositions, innovations. If somebody comes up with a new thing that's geared towards science or maybe a design, that can be potentially patented. That's the science stuff. So, for example, Optimus Prime, which you can all look at right there. Hey, ma'am, if you'd like, there's a exemplary patent right there. That one's actually on the old Hasbro toy, Optimus Prime. But basically, Optimus Prime is sort of a new invention. It's definitely a new toy. So that you can get a patent. Trademarks act as identifiers of source of goods. So you know you're getting a certain product by a brand. 
Anybody here have kids? Okay, anybody ever go into, let's say, CVS or Walgreens or any of those convenience stores during the holiday season, you're trying to get something for a kid real fast, you go down the aisle and you go find the, not Power Rangers, but you find the green powerful Jedi or powerful warrior, and it looks just like a Power Ranger, and you bring it home, that's trademarks at work, because your kid will know right away that that's not an authentic Power Ranger. That's identification of source of goods. And copyrights protect works of art in a tangible medium. So basically, the artwork that we see and we love and we know and we all talk about, that's a copyright. Any questions so far? So where, I'm sorry, a lay person, but where, sure. where do books fall in copyright? Copyright. Right? Yes. Okay. We'll get more into that, but that's a really good question. And in fact, it kind of leads into the question, you sort of jump right into it. Can you have all three protections at once? And the answer is yes, you can. So let's take, for example, anybody know these characters? Yes. Okay, so we've got Mario, Sonic, we've got actually Legend of Zelda, Link. So you got a video game here. You can use patented microchip technology. All these Nintendo systems that come out, for example, Switch, all these things, they get multiple patents on them. They do because they're all functional. They're all inventions. They all work. The reason why people buy them is because they're better than the last system. They improve. They got better graphics. They have quicker. They're faster. They're more mobile. Also, you can clearly have copyright. The artwork. I mean, look, we, we know Mario. We know Sonic. We know Link. And not only with the copyright, we also know that Mario is what brand? Nintendo. Nintendo. Link, oh, Sonic's going to be a little bit tougher. Sega. Right? It, it was Sega, you're right. We play Sega Lab. Yeah, so it's Sega. And then, of course, Link is Nintendo as well. But Sega, that's, I'm glad you said that. Oh. In another presentation I do that's a lot more complicated, um, if you play Sega a lot, there was a very large lawsuit that involved Sega and, everybody remember the Game Genie? Yeah, what you do is you plug in this machine into your Sega system, and it basically alters the code slightly. And what that did was it made the gameplay faster. So in other words, the really slow moving characters, all of a sudden now you can put them hyperspeed and have all sorts of stuff going on. And there's a big lawsuit as to can another company, Game Genie, actually modify the video cartridge and actually get away with it and sell it, even though they're not really changing the artwork, all they're doing is changing the functional code. Uh, we're not gonna get into that because it's really hyper technical and it's about you know, this big, about maybe 80 pages. So what is a patent? This is what a patent is. I'll tell you in lay terms what this means. This is right from the USPTO. What it means is this. A patent is a contract with the government which allows you to prevent others from making, using, selling, offering for sale a certain good or a certain product as defined by the claims in the patent. And it's for a limited period of time, it's for 20 years typically from the date of filing. Now, the reason why this is important is because it is a contract. So when you start off, and if I can have that Optimus Prime one back, I'll show you real quick. Back here, back here in all the nice legalese language, it will start with something like, what is claimed is, and then a reconfigurable toy assembly, and it goes off into this magical language that only attorneys and people that are <laughs> really, really, really having uh, problems sleeping and want to read this, and you'll fall asleep within about five minutes. Um, essentially, though, what this does is, like all contracts, a patent starts off with the patent applicant filing with the government and saying, I want everything, let's just say, for example, I want everything on that table. And being a good contract, the government will come back and say, no, we're not giving you anything because it's their job to make sure that what you're claiming, they can actually give you and to restrict it, to bring it down, to make sure you're not going into somebody else's patent who's already gone through this process. So what you get at the end of the day, hopefully, is you get a patent that issues with this, that has claims that start off with, instead of 15 items on the table, you get four or you get three. And that's sort of a give and take between the applicant and the yeah, government to come down to sort of what the patent will issue as. In this case, it issues as, and you can see this in a second, sir. It issues as a toy 
that turns from a truck into a robot. And by the way, if you actually read through this, I'll tell you having owned one of these myself, now that I actually saw the patent on it, I, I can say, okay, now I understand what I was supposed to actually do to transform this thing from a robot into a truck because before I had no idea and the instructions were not very clear. This is actually more clear than it was on the packaging it came with. So that's what a patent does. A patent basically is for an invention, you give it 20 years as a general rule. Sometimes you give it for less, sometimes you can give it for more, depending. Now there are three types of patents, and that's on that sheet. And here, sir, if you'd like to look Thank at that. Sure. There's a utility patent, design patents, and plant patents. I'm just going to gloss over plant patents really quick because plant patents are, are a little bit of a strange breed. It's very nuanced. You have to have certain qualifications for a plant to qualify to actually even be filed for a patent. And these are people that are sort of genetically manipulating plants into doing certain things. I'm going to gloss over that because the number of practitioners that deal with plant patents is such a small subset, it's not even funny. I've never done a plant patent. I can say it wholeheartedly, I probably never will do a plant patent. It's just not that common. Design patents are more common. Design patents, and they use this as an exemplary or an exemplar in the patent office itself. If you file a design patent, think of a hubcap. You know, it's not really artistic, but at the same point, it has a function and it should be protected, right? So they'll show pictures, new hubcaps, for example, new designs, new jewelry box, a new jewelry arrangement, like of a diamond or cut. That would be a design patent. Utility patents are what everyone thinks of. The Optimus Prime one right there is a utility patent. Basically, it's a new invention or it's a new chemical composition or it's a new thing that's manufactured. It's basically what we think of as the science stuff. New drill bit, or in Houston, that's pretty common. So, I'll go over this again real quick, because we have several other topics to go through. And we're 20 minutes in. Utility patents are broken down into several categories. There's processes, for example, if you have a process for making something, that can get a patent on. A machine, that can get something article of manufacture that can get a patent as well. Composition of matter, for example, if you invent a new chemical or pharmaceutical that you want to actually look to get a patent on, you can do that. And that's actually why a lot of the pharmaceutical drugs are so expensive, is because they want to keep the prices up high because they get a 20 year, they get a 20 year basically monopoly on it. So there's, there's different nuances to that as well, but People ask, why is it that drug prices are high? Well, they can do it because 20 years from now, they're going to have competitors that are going to come in who can undercut the price massively. But that's the same thing with any type of manufacturing. Patents also, if I showed you the patent, or if I brought in the patent rule, the MPEP, the Model Patent Examining Procedure, it's about two volumes this thick each. And there's so many little things you have to do and so many rules to follow filing a patent that that's why the patent test or I should say the USPTO examination to become a patent attorney is so difficult usually the pass rate is between 45 to maybe 50 percent passing and these are people that have to have a science background and most of them have law backgrounds as well so this is not a simple test of people off the street can go do it you have to actually be essentially a scientist and you can also be a lawyer but you have to be at least a scientist to even take the test so one of the first things about patents is first to file. So that means this, gentlemen in the Argyle sweater, sweater, if you invent something, you invent a phone, and I invent a phone at the same time, basically it's a race now. Who's gonna to go to the patent office to file for the patent application first? Whoever wins, generally become the first to file. I mean, there's rules around that. For example, if you stole it from you or I stole it from you, that's not really making you first to file or me first to file. It just means that, you know, somebody actually took the technology from somebody else it's a totally different story but the general concept is a lot of people invent stuff at the same time it really sounds strange but they do so the first one to go and actually file for it that's the one that can get the patent application priority date family style i say family style because and this gets really complicated very fast you can start off with what we call a parent patent application in which let's just say i file for this phone well let's say six months later while it's still being examined I discover I need to make a modification on the application. Well, you know what? I can branch off and get this. Now I've got two applications. Or I could get, after that, three. 
or four or 12, which happens a lot too. I had a case one time, start off with one patent application and our client got sued on 12 that issued it. So patents can break off into what we call family members, which would be parents, children, stepchildren, because they're not the exact same thing, but essentially think of it as a family tree. Uh, that's also a continuing legacy. Here's another thing too people don't realize. You don't need to actually physically have a working model to show the patent office. People think all the time, I gotta go get somebody right now to engineer and build this thing and put it into development before I file a patent application. I suggest usually just the opposite. Get the patent application on file first and then actually start putting money into it. Why? Because then you'll be the first to file. You're not gonna have somebody running there before you to get it. Now, you can't really do software. You used to be able to do software patents. You can't do it now. There's a court case that came down and said, we're not gonna let you have software. We're not gonna let you have business methods. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that, but essentially that's what the court case says. And design and utility, we talked about. That. Yes, ma'am. What, what does one do if they have a, a software idea? They copyright. can't copyright? Mm-hmm, copyright. Now, that's basically it on patents. Like I said, there's a lot more I can go into. We've got to go through three areas. So that's and a just real overview, that's Pat's. Any questions? Did I scare you now? Not yet? No. It's gonna get scary. I'm just kidding. Um, trademarks. Okay, anybody know what this is? No, it's a TARDIS from Dr. Who. I mean, I'm used as a trademark because usually I use this slide for presenting to a bunch of comic and sci-fi people. But trademark is a mark, word, symbol, or phrase used to identify a source of goods. Okay, so scared now. <laughs> um, source of goods, services, distinguish them from products of another. So for example, Buffy, Star Wars, Minecraft. There's more trademarks than meets the eye because people always think, oh, I see the words, you know, Godzilla, I see Nike, I see all these things. Yeah, but you can get pictures too, and you can get sounds. If there's a specific sound that comes out that somebody has to trademark, Dynamite by Jimmy Walker, if anybody remembers who that is, <laughs> that actually was trademarked. Colors, anybody have Starbucks? Anybody notice how the cups are always the same color green? How the awnings are always the same color green? Yeah, you know why? Because you know it's Starbucks. Smells, technically you can get smells for like perfume. Flavors, a trademark can be registered or unregistered. Now I'll talk about registered versus unregistered real quick. Everybody ever see a little TM symbol on something? That'd be unregistered. Anybody ever see a little circle R? That'd be registered. What's the difference? Well, registered means you've registered on a federal registry. So anybody who goes to the federal register for trademark can look up your trademark and can see that you have it. And it applies nationally. So people can go and say, oh, like Velvet Jew, for, for me, for example. Velvet Jew is a national trademark. Nobody who does band performances of music or whatever I actually do when I play can actually use Velvet Jew. Unregistered are the TMs, the common law marks. Basically, you have to register a trademark to seek to get protection and, and to get relief if you have to sue somebody. However, if it's unregistered, you're gonna have to prove that it's known, that it is a mark, and that locally where the infringement, if you don't call it that, is occurring, that's a well, that's a known mark, and you're using it to identify your source of goods. That's kind of how it works. So locally would mean, say for example, Houston, Texas, versus nationally, which could be, you know, Bangor, Maine. What else can cyber, or what else can trademark law protect, trademarks? Cyber squads. Anybody ever hear of the famous time in which Continental was being hijacked when the internet just started up by an adult? film site? Well, that's what happened. Basically, adult film site got continental.com, just when starting up. Nobody knew that trademarks and, and website presence was going to be important. So all of a sudden now, Continental is being told you pay, let's just say, $250 million, you can have this website. Pretty valuable for you. You want it back, right? Otherwise, we're just going to show adult movies on it the whole time. <laughs> and Continental is thinking, oh, well, we better get that pretty quick. We're going to lose customers real fast. That's called cyber squatting. You can't do that anymore. And that's exactly why you can't do it. Because it's not fair to have somebody who has a mark, 
who just didn't run off immediately and get a website and protect it that way versus somebody who doesn't even have a mark and basically is using, it's just essentially extort money from a company. So you can't do that anymore. So there can be registered mark infringement and unregistered mark, unfair competition, um, and dilution and misidentification goods. I'll lump these all together, but essentially it's like this. Have you ever gone to a place and you're like, gee, this looks like the product I'm looking for, but the name and the label looks a little different. I'll go with it. Maybe they changed their label or maybe they made some modifications to it. Well, that's generally what you're going to get when you get the unfair competition, dilution, and misidentification of goods. Because what they're doing is they're taking a well-known mark and trying to make what we call an instant business in which they confuse people to buy their product based on a well-known mark. So for example, if you had Nike shoes and they had a little swoosh on it, you know to go buy Nike, you like Nike products. If you had Nike shoes and they had an upside down swoosh, you might be thinking, oh, maybe Nike's doing something different. But what's really going on is somebody's trying to take their goodwill. They're trying to take their business away by unfairly competing and misinforming people as to where the goods are coming from. So what does it mean? What can I get in trouble for? Well, you can get in trouble for sitting on a domain. We just talked about that. You can get in trouble for passing off a product as being uh, sanctioned by a trademark holder. Microsoft Word Certify means a lot to people who are trying to get help on Microsoft Word, right? But now all of a sudden there's somebody who's not really Microsoft Word Certified actually is starting a business of consulting where they're going to get people and they lie to them and tell them that they're certified but they're not. That's a huge issue. You should be able to get in trouble for that. This one I'm gonna skip over the diluting fashion. It's more of a nuanced thing. Infringing a trademark, that's a little different than we're talking about right now. If you basically have Nike shoes and somebody else makes, you're not Nike company and they make this new Nike shoe that's not from Nike company but they're looking to actually make money off the brand, that's direct infringement because Nike owns this mark, the identification and source of goods. Somebody else is using the mark and they're using it illegally to make money. Confusing public as a source of good. These all fall in the same thing, and these can happen on a federal and state level. So if you have a trademark, unlike a patent, which always goes federal, you can sue in a state court for a trademark because you can have state registration of a trademark. However, you can also sue in federal court, which generally speaking, for these types of matters, I, at least my preference, I prefer to actually take care of these in a federal court. There's a lot of reasons why. I'm not going to get into them. We're in a state court right now. I don't want them to come over here and get all upset. <laughs> Defenses. Well, not everything is protected trademark. So people say, that's my trademark thing. That's my trademark magazine name. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean it is. Also, people have to be able to refer to things. So sometimes, if you're referring to a product by a name, you have to be able to refer to it. And that can't be a trademark misidentification because it's not actually using it as, as not showing identification with the good. All you're saying is like, I went and bought some Tylenol. Well, did you buy like headache medicine? No, I bought Tylenol, it's the brand name. I bought it. So you're not misidentifying the source of the goods. You're in fact supplementing. You're actually saying what good you actually bought. Marks are limited in scope. So for example, you can't own a, a word, you can't own a whole word. Lexus, you, anybody's using computers here? They have Lexus on them, right? Yeah, you everybody have a car or ever heard of a brand called Lexus? Yeah, well there's a big case between Lexus, the computer, legal software, and the car manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, you can't own everything. You can't necessarily file for a mark and say, I've got the word Lexus, so I can stop everyone from doing everything. And the argument is made to the court, well, hey, Lexus, the car manufacturer, you can't do this. And the court said, well, why can't we do this? And they said, well, people who use the Lexus software for legal things could actually drive Lexuses. And the court looked at him and said, that's not how we're viewing it because the fact of the matter is you owe it for the legal software, you don't own it for the car. You can't make that jump. True. Sometimes you can, but you can't really do that. You can't basically say, I, I can't stop everyone from using Velvet Jew. I can do it if they do music, but I can't do it if, for example, they have a car rental agency. 
So, here's some other things to remember too. It's misidentification of source of goods to a consumer. So guess what? If you're just using it, you're not giving it to consumers to look at, that's not infringement. How can it be infringement? You're not confusing anyone. You're just using the word. There's no consumers involved. So it has to be a consumer that's confused. You can't just say, you know, there's infringement because somebody on a website that's a private website that has limited access actually use this word. It doesn't work like that. You can also have clear disclaimers or non-licensed uses. Let me give you an example. Everybody ever see like a medical website where they say this product actually works with like the Clean Air 500 and it'll have like a little registered thing at the bottom or on the top, a little circle R. And then you go to the bottom of the page and it says Clean Air 5000 is not a product owned by blah, blah, blah. The term Clean Air 5000 or the mark is owned by this company. We do not claim ownership of this. Exactly. Because now you're telling the consumers, we don't make that product. All we're doing is saying our product is comparable with it and works with it. We're not telling you that we make that at all. We're just telling you that we make something that you can use with it. Now, research on trademarks prior to use. This is actually a big one. You would be shocked at how many times we deal with cases in which companies actually will file a name for their company. We want to be Smart Tech 500. Okay, did you go look and see if Smart Tech 500 is taken? Yeah, it went to the Secretary of State. There's no Smart Tech 500. That's great. Did you go to the trademark registry? Why do I need to do that? Well, it's real simple. If you're going to start selling goods and somebody has a registered trademark for Smart Tech 500, you own the website and you're starting to actually get into that market, but they actually have a registered trademark, you're basically charged with the knowledge you should have gone there and looked. It's a registered mark with the federal agency. You should have done your homework before you started putting that company together. It's not an uncommon problem. It happens a lot. People will just do the state search and say, hey, we've got this free and clear. We can make this corporation. They don't do a federal search. And then all of a sudden, they've got this company that they're getting investors looking into. And the first thing investors are saying is, wait a minute, there's a trademark already on this out there. You don't own it. You're going to get shut down. Why do we want to put money into this? So, and what I mean by shut down is this. If you misuse somebody's trademark, they can enjoin you. So they stop you from using it. So all of a sudden, let's say you have this company in the scenario I'm talking about. You put in five, you get $500,000 in investors. You get the shark tank people to put money into it. And all of a sudden, a company that basically has been in business or not even really doing much business in your area sees you using their trademark left, right, and center, they shut you down. Well, you're gonna lose that. Actual damages, like if you're selling the Nike shoes and you're selling like 17 million units of it, well, that's some serious money actually that, that you're using based on their mark. Now some of the statutory damages, this is when they have situations in which you can't tell how much money is really being associated with the trademark and how much is not. Because usually there's other things that go into it as well. You have a lower price point. You basically have a different, a bunch of people that you're promoting it to. The other company isn't doing certain things with the mark. So these types of damages come in and they look at it and they say, okay, we can't tell exactly how much is directly allocated to the trademark, but here's some units that we can use to try and figure it out. And the attorney's fees. Some situations you can get attorney's fees allocated if you need a case. That happens with patents too. Um, usually if they prove willful infringement, it's a lot more difficult to do. So again, here's the actual trademark. That's actually my trademark, so I won't get in trouble with anyone for misusing it, except for me. Um, and again, these are examples of this. Now, if you find yourself looking and saying, I got a really clever idea for marketing and I'm going to market this new product, I'm gonna call it this. You gotta ask your question, yourself a question, why am I doing this? If the answer to the question is, people love blank product, which sounds similar to it, it looks similar to it, I'm sure this will be a hit based on that, you probably have a trademark problem. So for example, um, Schneike versus Nike. People love Nike, I'm sure they'll love the Schneike shoes. Well, guess what? You, you just immediately answered your question saying, yeah, if that's why you're doing it, you probably do an issue. 
Now, I said that you can't protect everything. You really can't protect everything. And I'll stop real quick before I go further into this. Does anybody have any questions? Ma'am, yes. Um, none, none today. <laughs> Am I just totally overwhelming people making this <laughs> difficult? It's understandable, it's all good. Okay. You can't trademark everything in the world. You just can't. So for example, these two, generic, descriptive, you're not gonna get trademark on. Except for descriptive, you can after a period of time. I'll explain that in a minute. Suggestive and fanciful. Let me go through this real quick. Generic. If you have a magazine about fishing, and you call it a fishing magazine, should you get a trademark on it? No, why? Because you can't describe it any other way. If your magazine's about fishing, and you're looking for a trademark fishing magazine, how else are you gonna describe a magazine that's about fishing? It's just literally, it is what it is. You're basically saying what your product is doing. You know, if you had a, you wanted to get a trademark really good sneaker, and your sneaker's just really good, then it's gonna be very difficult to get it because it's generic. Now, if you had a magazine about electronics and you called it Fishing Magazine, yeah, you're gonna be able to get a trademark on that because guess what? You're no longer talking about fishing, you're talking about electronics. There's not quite a functional correlation. It's not generic anymore. Descriptive we see every day. The 124 dry cleaner, or the 162 dry cleaner, or however many you see just driving on 90, going all down here. If you're selling dry cleaning services for 124 a piece, well, that's what we call descriptive. It's not really generic because it's not a fishing magazine about fishing, but it's descriptive of what you're doing. You tell them the service that you're providing. 124 will do dry cleaning. Now, you can't straight off the bat get protection on that. And the reason why is because it's descriptive. However, after usually a five year period of you using it, you can argue to the federal court, you can argue to the trademark office that, guess what? I've been using this for five years straight. This thing has acquired what we call a secondary meaning. In other words, it's become a staple of society. It's become a staple of my community. And people know this. They start to affiliate a certain quality with my goods, with what I'm doing. So if you can manage to actually get it to that period of continual use, you can make a good argument that, hey, I've been in business for five years. People know the 124 dry cleaner. They go by and they do this five years they've been doing this. That's how you can argue descriptive that you'd be entitled to it. Now, suggestive is pretty straightforward. Victoria's Secrets are really suggestive. The suggestive is a secret. There's something going on there. It's lingerie, but something's happening. It's not descriptive, because it doesn't say Victoria's lingerie, but it is suggestive. Fanciful, that's a Nike swoosh. The little swoosh on the, on the shoe, what does it mean? Nothing. Who cares? It doesn't make a difference, but why is it gonna get meaning? Because that's just it. It's not generic, clearly. It's not descriptive. So the rule simply is, the more fanciful and the more creative you are of a trademark, the better chance you have getting a trademark. So this is basically, again, and I'll gloss over this because we've got some more stuff to go through. You know, why am I doing this? Clear disclaimers if you're going to be talking about a licensed good. And private use is not going to be infringing. This was basically, um, I'm going to skip this slide, but it's okay. And again, we talked about trademark infringement. So we're going to talk about copyright next, because we have less than 20 minutes. That's pretty clear what the copyright statute is, right? It's very easy to understand, very just straightforward, right? But it's not. It's basically works of art in a tangible medium, which includes music, literary works, dramatic works, dances, pictures, sculptures, movies, sound recordings, and architectural works. What if it's not in a tangible medium? What if it's a chat it keeps changing? Who owns that? What if it's in a game? What if like, for example, and I talk about this actually uh, for the University of Texas, what if it's a game? Like, like you know, I'll just tell you right now, one of the biggest industries people don't realize, that's just huge apart from films, is gaming. Gaming is gigantic these days. Card games like Yu-Gi-Oh, those types of things. I read recently, uh, was it 16 billion? 16 billion. You're talking about with video games, 36 billion. It's a lot of money. 
and you're talking about also with just these like Dungeons and Dragons things, role playing games, it's going to be close to 12 billion. They say in the next two years, 12 billion. It's a lot of money. So. What about these games though? Because they're not really a tangible medium. You have these meetings, you have, you make your own, you know, basically Lord of the Rings adventure going on. Is that protectable? Is that protectable from copyright? I mean, it's a really good question. What about when you play a video game? Is it when you run through the video game? It's clearly got artwork, it's clearly got a story going forward. Is that protectable? And the answer to that question is, it's fact specific. So it really depends on what's going on, how it's recorded, how things are actually presented, and who's actually involved with it. So I'm not trying to be sneaky or anything, but it's really a very hotbed topic uh, in terms of copyright law, in terms of who owns these things. Uh, there's lots of lawsuits involving video game manufacturers. Lots of them involving what's called Wizard of the Coast, which is actually the ones that make Dungeons and Dragons. It's become a much bigger industry than it used to be, and the laws are starting to just sort of formulate and sort of work together into getting a cohesive um, package of, of rules. So what can I do? Copyright. You know, look, if everything's artistic, how do I get away with doing anything? How can, how do I, I mean, I've got pictures on these slides. How am I getting away with this, right? I didn't draw them all. Defensive, fair use, private use, non-publication, work for hire. So let's talk about copyright infringement. Okay, we didn't really talk about the other ones really much, but we'll talk about this because I know you mentioned the other copyright. I think you mentioned, sir, with the sweater that you had a copyright question too. Copyright infringement requires ownership of valid copyright, which is kind of important because it's not as easy to get as one might think. And copying of constituent elements of the work that are original. It's pretty tricky. What if I take a phone book? What if I start copying a phone book, put numbers down? Is that copyright infringement? What's original? What's artistic? Okay. You can answer if you like, but it's okay. Now, we'll talk about a little more on this, but copyright damages. Okay, they can enjoin you, stop you from doing it actual damages, how much money are you making selling, you know, Larry Botter and the Sorcerer Stone? I mean, it's a knockoff book, it's probably, we could say, copyright infringement. Statutory damages. And here's another thing, too, that actually comes into copyrights that's kind of different than a lot of other statutes. Courts have the ability to award, by statute, attorney's fees on registered works. Why is that so different? There is no statute for, for patents that says you can give attorney's fees. There's no really statute for trademarks that say you can give attorney's fees. This one says in cases the court deems or the judge deems to be appropriate, they can award attorney's fees. Whoa, wait a second here. That's pretty huge. Because now if somebody's actually suing somebody for copyright infringement and they win the case, well, heck, they're going to get their attorney's fees back too. That itself can be a massive damage. I mean, th that can be a huge deterrent. Basically, I said, you better stop copy my copyright and you said what are you going to do about it well I'll bring you to court because it's registered and if I win I get my, my attorney's fees well I'll tell you $90,000 for a law case for a lawsuit copyrights you have to pay $90,000 on top of what you're paying your attorney that's a pretty large deterrent you know but it's a huge deterrent nobody wants to pay. yes ma'am I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you that's okay so there's no way to read every book in the world, right? Sure. But if you start writing a book and you have no idea that your idea is similar to a book that's already written, mm -hmm. I guess where's the line on when you can get sued and when you can't? <laughs> sure. Does that make that sense? That all comes into this too. And you're right. But let's talk about this too. I mean, it's a little bit more, it's a lot more nuanced than this. There's ownership of the valid copy. Okay, so copyrights are gonna last for a duration period of time. Let's just say it's life of the author plus roughly 80, 75, 80, maybe 100 years. And I say that because Disney actually, once it starts coming towards Mickey Mouse coming up for Steamboat Willie, and if you think about it, that's just about 100 years right now. Once it starts coming up, then they change the law and they increase the time. 
They called it the Sunny Bono Act, which in one of the recent times they did. You know, they did like, say, 40 years, it's been 50 now. It's been 60. How about 70? How about 80? How about 100? And it gets even more complicated because if you have a work that's actually got an anonymous author, well, all of a sudden that's going to have a different time frame. And if you have works that are joint authorship, that has a different time frame too. So as opposed to patents, when you can clearly say it starts here, ends here, copyrights, it's like starts here, kind of goes over here. Let's just say 100 years though, okay? So straight off the bat, if you start taking sections from, you know, Wolfenstein, um, Shelley's Frankenstein, that's already past copyright date. There's actually a good website um, that actually, the Gutenberg Press, will actually tell you what copyrights have actually expired. So a lot of the Wizard of Oz stuff is expired. But your question more directly to it is this. Copying constituent elements of work that are original. If you just accidentally come up with something that's very similar to what they have, without knowing about it, well, you're not really copying it. You're just independently creating it, okay? So you're gonna have to have access to it and know it exists. And they kind of have to show that you took this work and you actually you know, actively are making a copy of it. If you independently create, it can say that, for example, you never read Harry Potter, which is gonna be a difficult one to sell. <laughs> but let's say you never read Harry Potter and magically you actually drafted a 400 page manuscript that actually reads exactly like Harry Potter, you might be able to get away with them saying no copyright infringement. However, especially when you get to literature works, it's very tough to do that. I mean, if, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Now, it's not to say that, that you can't. I mean, it's not to say it doesn't happen. It does happen. Music, it happens. Uh, because, for example, if somebody is saying, I'm just going to start off on the, you know, F scale and I'm going to do this, and all I'm going to do is, you know, I'm going to make a, basically it's a 4 4 time signature, I want to have it 125 beats per minute, and I've got the kind of arrangement I want to do. Well, you might end up having something that's somewhat similar to another piece of music. Now, the question again comes in copying constituent elements that are original. Mm -hmm. And the question comes in, what is the jury going to find? Anybody here ever hear the song My Sweet Lord? Mm -hmm. By by Harrison, right? Yeah. Anybody here ever, ever hear the song He's So Fine by the Shrells? Mm -hmm. Hum them. And tell me what you think. Because guess what? It's the same song. Mm -hmm. But the question is, how did you get there? And sometimes you get there different ways. Sometimes you don't get there different ways. Sometimes you clearly aren't getting there different ways. Um, fair use. That's kind of, again, I mean, I'm going to go, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, so it's a question of degrees. But when we talk about fair use now, we're talking about defenses for copyright infringement. Because guess what? You, you, it's very hard to actually go through life without being able to say, for example, Picasso. Or without being able to say, Starry Night by, um, you know, uh, Vincent Van Gogh. It's very hard to be able to go through life without being able to reference certain copyright materials or artistic work. So the question is, how much can we do it and what can we get away with? What is the court going to allow you to do? Well, there's the purpose and character of the use. And I'll go through these in a little more detail right now. Purpose. The purpose and character of the use, let's say you're writing a book, is it commercial or non-profit educational purposes? Well, I'm doing right now is I'm educating. So all these little weird drawings I get from online, I'm using it for one purpose whatsoever, and that's to teach. It's not to actually have a commercial nature. I don't get paid for this. I don't make money off of those things. I don't do any of those things. There's no profit. It's basically for me educating people. So when I use Batman as an example, or I use Mario, all I'm doing with those are demonstratives. They're basically designed to say, hey, look, this thing actually exists, and it is copyrighted, or it is trademarked. So generally speaking, teaching and nonprofit uses and some potential private uses can actually work in terms of the purpose. If, for example, you're doing a concert and it's a nonprofit concert, you're doing a 501c3, you're doing it for charity, you play some songs that actually are written by other people and you need to really pay, you know, what's called ASCAP fees. Um, in other words, you should be paying licensing fees for them. Are you really making a profit? What's the damages to them? 
or are you you're doing it for charitable purposes maybe the purpose is actually okay in fair use now how about the nature of the copyrighted work okay i go and i make a handout based on something i got in the uspto right that's all factual information they present it for the public for people to actually consume so the nature of that work is it's not artistic there's nothing artistic in those things there's nothing artistic in that pattern that's being going around in fact it's totally functional it's designed to show people what you can't do how can you not copy it i mean basically if you can't copy it or look at it how are people to know what they can't do so if it's functional like a phone book for example that'd be fair use i mean it, all it does is give information names addresses phone now the amount it's fairly straightforward but it's not exactly straightforward how much did you copy? If basically you're writing a piece in which you're making a comment on Harry Potter and you cite to 250 pages worth of Harry Potter and the book itself is 252 pages, <laughs> that's a problem, okay? Now, if you basically, again, if you, here's where it gets tricky. If you take one photo out of a collection of photos and you use that, but you're not making a comment on it, but just using it anyhow, like you go to the internet and you take something like, oh, everybody says everything's free on the internet. Internet's free, it's not free. You go take something and you put it up on your website and it's a photo and Getty Images owns it, which is a big company. They'll have the robot trollers go around all the time and say, who's actually got a website actor that's actually using this? Do they have a license? And if they don't, they'll send you a nice little letter. And this happens to my clients all the time. Send you a letter, give me a thousand dollars because you don't have a license. You know, a license was $10, but now that you violated it, it's thousand dollars. Pay the $1,000 and never do it again. You talk to the client, you want to pay, you want to fight it. Do you have a license? No. Where did you get this from? Well, it's found it on the internet. Okay, we've got a problem. How are we going to fight that? It's a serious issue. So, uh, the moral of that story is if it's worth going online to like, you're building a website or you're using images, pay the 10 bucks. You have to pay a 1000 later. Value. Now, here's the thing too. What's the value or the effect on the potential market for the copyright work? If you're making knockoff copies of, let's just say, who's that new one that's really, uh, Billie Eilish, is that the one? If you're making knockoff copies of Billie Eilish records and selling them, you're selling them like a dollar lower, but you're selling them, you can sell a thousand units, nine bucks, nine thousand dollars, well that's gonna affect the market for sure, because now she's losing money on her own copyright work, assuming it's copyright. And this comes to a derivative work because it's not even as simple as you make an art piece and now nobody can copy it because they can't for a period of time. However, copyright owners are also entitled to derivative works. So for example, if somebody makes a picture, uh, anybody seen the famous Campbell's Soup thing from Andy Warhol? Anybody know, you know what I'm talking about? If I showed you a picture, I don't have a picture of it, but if I showed you a picture, you know what I'm talking about. It's got like nine different versions of the same picture of Campbell's Soup, but they're all colorized different ways. This was really popular in the 60s. Just everybody, this is the hottest thing. And then everybody started making like nine pictures of Marilyn Monroe, but this one has a red background. This one has a blue background. This one has a green background. Well, that's probably a derivative work, and they're probably actually making money off of it because people are thinking it's just like the original. So you can't do that. Let me give you another example. This one's really a cute example because it happened in, in the field of I hold deer, which is comics and all those types of things. Back in the 50s, they had a Batmobile. It was really stylized. And if everybody's ever seen it, it's got a big Batman logo in front, giant head. Just huge. I mean, if they made it, it would be about this high. Just a like Batman. Somebody did make it. They made basically a, a working car that actually was the Batmobile from the 1950s. They bring it to the comic shows and they got sued. Why'd they get sued? They got sued because it's a derivative work. And so they, the, the company that sued them, which is DC, they basically said, it's a derivative work. It's, you took our artistic, just drawing of the Batmobile and you made it into a real car. They said, come on, that's ridiculous. You can't get a copyright on anything that's functional. It's not artistic, it's a working car. And then the court turned around and said, got a question for you. Why do people come see your car? And they say, they come see it because it's a Batmobile. You just answered the question. 
because now the purpose of this thing is not that it's a functional car. They don't care what type of engine you have in there. They don't care how many doors you have. They care about the fact that artistically, it's a derivative work and looks like the Batmobile. It's a real Batmobile. Guess what you lose? Because it's the artistic work that they're actually concerned about. So here's some examples of derivative works. You see new Sherlock Holmes novels sometimes. Not as much. Twilight. Anybody know Twilight? Anybody know Fifty Shades of Grey? Anybody know that one of them is a derivative work of the other? Yeah, it is. They, they're, they're basically, it's a fan fiction, if you want. Movies. Who hasn't seen anybody, everybody go on the internet ever? You see those kids that have lightsabers and blasting stuff and all that? Yeah, that's a derivative work. Oh, video games. You know, like if they make Spider-Man 17, somebody makes a knockoff of it, that's a derivative work. Uh, anybody's ever gone to the comic show? Anybody ever gone? Okay, let me tell you this. There's a whole aisle section called Artist Alley. Just rows and rows of artists selling stuff. Um, they're selling Batman paintings, a lot of them. Can I tell you how many are licensed? I, I, mean, I can't tell you how many are licensed. I don't think there are very many at all. But the bottom line is that the derivative works. Mm -hmm. If you ever find yourself saying it's based on this, Chances are it's a derivative work. Based on the Batmobile. Based on this drawing from this time. Okay, so here's the actual law. And this basically says copyright owner owns the right derivative works. Now, I'm gonna skip over transformations because we're running kind of short on time and I wanna take some questions. Here's one I do want to talk about, work for hire. People hire people to do stuff all the time. I hired, you know, I hired Trina to work in the office. What happens if Trina actually makes a nice painting during office time? Like, I don't know, I'll give her work to do one day and she just comes up with this fantastic painting and we want to keep it because it was done during our office hours. Who owns that work? Who owns that right, Trina? You do, that's right. She owns it, we don't because we didn't have a contract that says it's a work for hire. Generally speaking, the person who creates the work actually owns the work. Why is this a problem? Um, I wish the computer code lady was still in here. It's really relevant to that. But people used to do this all the time. They'd get hired to write computer code for a company. Right, right, right. It's been two years, hundred or $100,000 in investment of this guy or woman writing this code. End of the day, they got a code product. They gave it to the people. So they got a code product. And they say, okay, thank you for giving us the code product. And they say, well, let me just mention something I forgot to tell you. You hired me to do the code product, but under copyright law, I own the code product. I say, okay, well, no, you don't. We own it or take it. I say, well, take it as much as you want, but I put an embedded code in there. And if you don't have my, my code password in there, you never can get this thing to work out. And the company says, you're basically, you know, seeking to, to blackmail us and you're giving you more money because of the fact that you're not giving us the code. And and they say, well, it's too bad. You, you know, I wrote it. I'm the artistic person who owns it. And it's, you know, there's nothing that says that you own it. You may have hired me, but so what? So the bottom line of that is you hire somebody, you better get in writing that anything they create is a company's. I don't care if it's a patent, I don't care if it's a trademark, I don't care if it's anything. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, you could potentially be fighting that situation. That's a pretty nasty situation. Now, if you're hired directly to do a job, apart from the work from hire code right here. If you're hired directly to do a job for a specific task, there's many state laws now that are gonna say, you know, guess what? You were hired specifically to do a specific task. Part of that task is assigning this. You know, if you didn't actually do it, you failed under your contract, you can be sued for breach. So that's a completely another way to attack it. However, why do you even face the problem? Just make it real clear up front. I hired you to do the work. I own everything. So, that's basically it, and we're a little bit over, we're two minutes over, but I'm gonna ask anybody, because you have to have questions. I mean, and by the way, I just went over like the barest tip of the iceberg for this stuff. Um, there's a lot more fun. But what, what, do you have any questions? Did I answer any questions anybody had? Mm -hmm. Well, you did for me, yes. For you, yes. Yeah. Ma'am? Yes, sir. Because in my case, I'm working on an invention in mine, 
and uh, it's related to software development. Sure. And it works, and it provides value to the user or mm -hmm. end consumer. Uh, so I learned that it's for me to look for a copyright instead of a patent, okay. right? Again, this is, and I can't go into specific things for specific people's questions. I can say that, again, I would advise talking to an attorney about specific instances. The general rule, this is the general rule, is you can't get copyrights on software anymore. However, that's the general rule. That's not specific instances. There are some specific instances in which you absolutely can. Um, there are some instances in which operational programs working with actual physical things, let's say for example a computer or a physical device in which we have what's called a transformative use, can actually generate patentable material. So the answer is don't, I mean generally speaking if somebody came to me I would say don't give up on the patent idea, it depends on specifically what you're looking to do. But there are certain things that you can do. That's the best I can do, obviously, you should, you should, sure. without, <laughs> without becoming a client. It's, yes, ma'am. You have a question. Thank you. Oh, I could probably sit here for hours and pick your brain, but I'm good right now. <laughs> you don't have a general question? You answered my general question earlier. No more you know, questions. Right. If you're starting to write something, you know, just the fear of copying <laughs> someone else's work, you know? That That is by, f okay, let me toss one thing here, too. That is the least fear you should have. And let me also toss something here too, which we did not go over, which I can say generally speaking. If you're talking about the cost of how much it costs to get things, for example, it's not uncommon for a patent, including attorney time, including illustrators, including filing fees, to be north of $10,000 for just the application. If you're talking about a trademark, it's maybe about $1,000 with time and filing fees. If you're talking about a copyright, it's $55 plus whatever attorney time it takes. Oh, wow. Okay. So, okay. if you're ever thinking of getting a copyright, go get a copyright. I mean, it's, it's economically, it's by far the, the best value you're ever going to get for a company, period. I've got copyrights myself. It's, it's, it's just phenomenally economically cheap and good. So, this might be a dumb question, but does the same rule apply to a copyright as what you said with a patent that you go and try to get your copyright before you're officially finished with your written work or is that something you do once once everything's finished that's a fantastic question the answer is generally speaking okay let's answer this two ways one is that if it's a literary work you really probably want to be done with it at least your first draft mm -hmm. generally speaking if it is a collection of photographs or a collection of uh, pieces you're going to want to, and you're starting to sell them, you're going to want to get a copyright sooner rather than later on the individual pieces. And let me explain to you why. Part of something I go into this is that with the attorney's fees, you have to actually file for your copyright to sue people. And if you don't file in a timely manner, let's say you wait three years, you're going to lose certain rights. That's just how it is. I mean, they want people to file because then people know there's a copyright actually out there. And, and the incentivization of 55 bucks is you should file a copyright. But if you're looking to sue, the minute that you sue, they're gonna look and say, well, when did you file the copyright? And the answer is if you haven't filed a copyright, you're not gonna be able to sue anyhow because you're gonna to have to seek federal protection. The question is gonna be, okay, you seeking federal protection, what copyright are you suing under? Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yes. So copyright, and again, the copyright is just so simple. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's simple to file them, I'm just saying, for 55 bucks, it's, it's, and call an attorney, and attorney spend maybe two hours on it. I mean, you can, I mean, I've done it before with albums in which you've done like 15 songs, 55 bucks, whoa, there you go. That's a good deal, yes sir. Regarding that comment, it's the cheapest way, but would that be the adequate avenue? I'll answer this. I pointed out there are three, you can have protection for all things on one device. You can have protect yeah. three types. So, no, you want to exactly. basically do copyright and trademark and patent. All of them if you can. Sure. 
I mean, basically, you, you form what we call portfolio, which is multiple protections. I mean, it's real simple. Do a website and you have a product you're selling. Well, look at the trademark immediately. So people don't steal it. It's the general. And, sorry, and which would the order be? Which will be the order of <laughs> filing? Well, <laughs> that's a good question, and the answer is. The order is in which, optimally speaking, if everything is actually set and done, you're going to want to file probably your patent first, then copyright, then trademark. That's generally the best order. Yeah. Remember, Definitely. patent is first to file. So you want to run there as fast as you can. Second one is copyright because if you wait too long, you lose certain rights. Trademark is use it or lose it, essentially what the standard is. So if you're using it already, you just mark it as a site TM or something, you know, you can still show that you're using it as identification source of goods. That's the last one you want to do. Jim. And in your case, as a lawyer. Yes. Uh, oh. <laughs> I mean, yes. regarding your service. Yes. Uh, do you provide the service of a licensing if needed? You mean like, yes. Yeah, we, we do. I mean, generally speaking, okay, I mean, we didn't go into this much because this is about just generally IP. I litigate these things too. So I've gone to the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, which if you're going to ask where does it rank in the hierarchy, the Supreme Court, Federal Circuit Court of Appeals is right below. So I've been involved in cases that have actually made patent law, where we've argued and we've prevailed, and they market what's called precedential. So we actually made patent law in terms of this is the law of the land. You know, will it stand up test of time? I don't know, but yes, I litigate them, I license them, I do all that stuff. 